And it kind of made me think, why don't we do that? Why are we losing that? You know, it, it's so special. And, and I think it taught all of the crew too. Great. So hi, hi me, Amelia. I really enjoyed the film. It was an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I suppose you've acted from, from a very young age. I have vivid memories of watching you in an episode of Doctor Who, also doing some singing as you also do in this film. Uh, I, so I suppose Ruby struggled to balance her family life with chasing her creative dreams must be something that, that you're quite used to now. How do you find the, the balance between those two aspects? That's a great question. I actually didn't really think about that. I haven't seen my family and friends for almost a year. Um, luckily, my, my mum's here right now, so I, I'm with my mum. But you're in this adult world and you, you have to kind of be mature. But also, you are still quite young and you do you do want your family. And, and I guess I, I related with Ruby a lot. You know, this film is a love letter to family and the Rossies are such a tight-knit family. You know, they do everything together, Ruby interprets for them 24 seven. So they really are inseparable. And I, I feel the same way towards my family. I, I love them and I don't like being apart from them at all. Oh, sometimes I get a good feeling, yeah. yeah. You're the girl with the deaf family? Yeah. yeah. And you sing. Interesting. As an 18 year old about to head off to university, an awful lot of the plot resonated with me. Yeah. I suppose you, know, you, you were effectively the same age as your character when you when you shot the film. Do you find that that, that emotional connection helps you with your performance? I do. I think, you know, a lot of the time people cast 25 or, or mid 20s to play 17. And I understand why, you know, they're older, they've got more experience, um, they can work longer hours. But I think there is something so special, I think especially with Coda about casting someone that is kind of at that moment in life where you're kind of in that transition to adulthood. And you're not quite there yet. You don't want to leave your childhood. You don't want to take on all that responsibility, but also you feel like you are old and, you know, you feel like you, you want to be an adult. And I think, you know, there's something so nice. The camera, it, it shows that youth. And so I was, I was happy that Sean wanted everything in this film to be authentic. And I was really happy that she wanted Ruby to actually be 17. One of the, the first decisions you seem to have made when you, you came on board with the project was to ensure that there was deaf representation by casting deaf actors in, in the central roles. I was interested in the steps that you, you then took behind the character to ensure that the, the story was told as authentically and as truthfully as possible. I was always committed to casting deaf actors to play the deaf roles. Um, that felt important to me, not just, you know, in terms of the world and it being the right thing to do, but also just creatively. Like the opportunity that lived in that as a director to me was so um, beautiful and exciting. And um, But I also was an outsider coming into this community and I was very aware of that and felt an enormous responsibility to to take care with the story and with the culture and make sure that I had people around me who were from the community who could speak to the experience, you know, the lived experience. And so not only, you know, was it important to me to have deaf actors in those roles, but to have deaf collaborators behind the camera. And so those those creative allies for me and, and empowering those collaborators to kind of check my own hearing perspective as somebody coming in new to this community, it was important to know what I didn't know and then make sure that I had people around me who could help me tell the story in an authentic way that um, would feel reflective of the community that was representing. I can't stay with you for the rest of my life. I've never done anything without my family before. So in, in that, that period of preparation, you were, you were learning sign language, you were uh, being taught how to use a professional fishing boat, you were having singing lessons. So when you, get, when you get to the set and you've got all these new skills, how do you ensure that that preparation is actually helping your performance and building the character rather than just going to waste? When you get on the set, how do you utilise what you've been taught? 
you know, I learned for such a long time. I learned ASL for such a long time prior to flying out. But it wasn't really till I landed. It wasn't till then that I really learned. I think, you know, it's like when you're learning French, go live in France for a while, surround yourself, you know, immerse yourself into, into the world and the culture. And I guess with singing, I had worked very hard on the songs and I found a connection with them. I made sure that as Ruby, I could relate to the lyrics. And I think, you know, you, you work very hard and then you turn up and you're like, well, I now have to bring it. <laughs> I have to bring all of these skills the best that I can, you know. Given that, that intense kind of nine months of, of learning uh, so many different skills at, at the same time, I was interested if through learning American Sign Language, the way that you communicate with hearing people in your everyday life has changed. Are you communicating with more physical expression now? A hundred percent. I think during filming, I definitely did. I used to, I used to drive my mum mad. I, if I was asking, say, what's for dinner, and I just had a shower, instead of shouting from room to room, I would <laughs> walk water all the way through the house just to come and be in the same room and, and talk to her. Working with Troy, Daniel, Marley, all of our amazing interpreters, everybody taught me the real, the real meaning of communication. Everybody taught me connection and eye contact. I think, you know, nowadays, everybody's on their phones and things. And, you know, someone might bring you a water or something and they're like, oh, thank you so much. And, you know, you're looking down at your phone. And Daniel really taught me this in particular because he would always look and give the person eye contact and say, thank you so much. And it kind of made me think, why don't we do that? Why are we losing that? You know, it, it's so special. And, and I think it taught all of the crew too, uh, the true meaning of communication. It taught us all so much and it did make me more physical. It made me more emotional. I felt I embodied what I was saying. It, it, it allowed me to get out of my head and there were no words to hide behind. It kind of made me vulnerable and, and, and I guess more truthful in a way. And it was different, you know, normally when you act, it, it's kind of less is more in a way. You know, your, if your film goes to a cinema, your eye could be the size of a bus or something. So you can internalize a lot of emotions and you can still read them. So it was very, it was a very, very different experience, but I love a challenge. So I, I loved doing this, this project. I've been coaching for Berkeley College of Music. I can help you get a scholarship. So I suppose as, as a majority of the film is in uh, American Sign Language, uh, did you shoot these scenes differently to how you uh, shot scenes with spoken dialogue? Is there, is there a different approach to filming these conversations? ASL is a very cinematic language, so you're literally watching a visual representation of words and ideas and emotions. Um, so in that way, it's just, you know, you can put your camera on a, on a signed scene and, and it's very alive. Um, at the same time, when people are in an ASL conversation, they are planted and looking at each other and engaged. And so a lot of the tools that you have as a director to, you know, blocking or, you know, have a character walk out of the room as they're talking and throw a line over their shoulder or turn around. It's like there isn't the same kind of movement in a scene. You know, it really sort of people are looking at each other and they're looking into each other's faces and engaging and it's very human and connected. And, and you know, it meant that there wasn't a lot of camera movement, actually, that we were really sort of finding ways to be in the intimacy of those scenes and, and capture the language itself and make sure we were always had hands in frame, which meant, you know, your tool as a filmmaker of going into a close-up in an emotional moment, um, you know, you're like, well, I'm not going to do that because actually I'm cutting off the language. So what's another way to kind of be with a character and not be in close-up? So I actually love this question because it really did affect, you know, the cinematic choices of how we were going to move the camera and use the camera within scenes. You mentioned the importance of, of the, the family dynamic in the film. I think that's one of the aspects of the film that is so brilliant, brilliantly captured is how authentic and truthful the connection between between the characters is. I was interested in, with your character being a child of deaf adults, how did you work with the director and, and the other actors that, that you were acting at the side to ensure that there was a believable dynamic at the centre of the family? I was very lucky because on our film set, all of our interpreters were coders. So although I did a lot of 
prep and research prior to flying out to Massachusetts. I then was surrounded by coda, codas during the process. And it was nice for, for Sean and I actually, because it meant that sometimes we would do a scene and Sean would call cut and the codas would be crying. And that was kind of a moment for us where we thought, okay, we're telling something that is accurate, it's truthful and people can relate. 